Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, 2018 Annual General Meeting of the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. My name is Mark Mercer and I'm uh, the president of SAFS. I joined SAFS in 2006 uh, when Peter March, uh, one of my colleagues in philosophy at uh, St. Mary's in Halifax, posted the Jylan Poston's cartoons on his office door. Uh, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship was the only organized voice that took issue with the way our administration handled the situation and treated Peter, and I was uh, very impressed. I had my first article published in the uh, SAFS newsletter in 2006, September 2006. I was uh, brought onto the board of directors of SAFS in 2009, late in 2009, and then in May 2015 I became the, uh, the president following Clive Seligman, who had spent 15 years as uh, president of SAFS. I'm not going to spend 15 years <laughs> as president of SAFS, uh, but a few more years. Uh, I finish, I'm fin today is the, uh, the end of my third year, the beginning of my fourth year as president, and um, uh, I'm uh, uh, very happy with uh, the way the, uh, the society is, uh, is, is going, and uh, uh, I'll be uh, president for another couple of years, uh, uh, membership willing. SAFS was founded in 1992. Its mission is to defend and promote academic freedom and academic excellence. Our members have an expansive conception of academic freedom, including freedom in research, freedom in teaching, freedom in criticizing the university, uh, freedom of service. We stand for transparency and fairness, uh, openness, due process in uh, university affairs. We take students not only to be learners, but as junior members of the intellectual communities that, uh, to which we belong. Uh, we oppose dishonesty in scholarship, and we oppose indoctrination in teaching. We support the free exchange of ideas, uh, both on campus and by university people in, say, social media, newspapers, um, other venue. Uh, we advocate the culture of disputation at universities and are worried by the encroachment of the culture of celebration. Uh, not that there aren't things to celebrate, but uh, university culture, we think, should essentially be a culture of disputation. Academic decisions, SAFS holds, should be made on academic grounds alone, and that's why we oppose admitting students or hiring or promoting professors according to race, sex, or ethnicity. Academic freedom and academic excellence. There are two ways in which SAFS serves its mission. The first is advocacy, the second is teaching. As advocates, we communicate with presidents of universities and presidents of uh, uh, faculty unions and other people when uh, the board determines that academic freedom or academic excellence is, uh, has been violated or is under threat. We respond uh, on the basis of the consensus of the eight-member board, and the letters that we send are published on our website. We wrote eight letters in the uh, uh, previous year, 2017, 2018, the, uh, the, the, the current year, uh, which is higher than usual. I think our average is about five, uh, some years down to four, uh, but uh, eight letters in a year is uh, uh, pretty substantive. Our education mission, we, um, uh, we pursue uh, in a variety of ways. One, we sponsor events on campus, panel discussions, talks. Uh, we have our newsletter comes out three times a year. The annual general meeting, the annual general meeting mainly for members, but uh, we're happy that uh, uh, people who aren't members of SAFS uh, come to the meeting and uh, 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 learn about SAFS and uh, perhaps uh, uh, join. Membership in SAFS is only $25 a year, and if you can't afford $25, $15 will get you a, a membership. If you're 60 or older, $150 for a lifetime uh, membership, and you never have to pay again. Um, <laughs> We sponsored three events this year. Uh, there, were, there was a panel discussion and a talk at Mount uh, uh, Royal University in, um, in Calgary. At Mount St. Vincent University, we had a question and answer period. And at St. Mary's University, a panel discussion on freedom, academic freedom for students. We were to uh, help out with a fourth event, a panel discussion at McMaster University, but it was canceled uh, when the, uh, one of the three panelists 
withdrew in protest over the presence of uh, one of the other panelists. Uh, the, uh, the organizers uh, um, canceled it. I'll mention that uh, this coming Wednesday in uh, Waterloo, Wednesday 9 May in Waterloo at 7 p.m., does university indigenization threaten open inquiry? This is a SAFS-sponsored event along with the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry and uh, Francis Whittleson will uh, uh, speak on that topic at uh, uh, Waterloo on uh, Wednesday. I think we missed a couple of cases last year and I want to, uh, to mention that. Um, the strike by Ontario College uh, professors uh, was something that SAFS didn't have uh, much to say about and I regret that. We published an article in our newsletter by a couple of professors from uh, Sheridan, but I don't think it got to the, uh, to the heart of the issues. Um, academic freedom for college professors might be a very different thing than academic freedom for um, university professors, especially at institutions of liberal education, but it is a, uh, an important, uh, uh, important matter and I hope that we can uh, pursue it uh, um, in the future, uh, maybe at the annual general meeting next year and uh, uh, maybe in the newsletter. I think also that SAFS uh, should uh, have a higher profile in some of the um, uh, university processes that have gone on this year with regard to academic freedom. I'm thinking especially of Wilfrid Laurier, the task force on, uh, on academic freedom there, and at uh, UBC. There was also a small process at McMaster University, and uh, I think uh, uh, SAF should be uh, um, uh, a, a bit more uh, uh, vocal uh, than it has been. Um, SAFS is entirely funded by membership dues and donations. Uh, our members are very generous. Uh, we, uh, we receive uh, uh, good money in, um, uh, in, in donations and always happy about that. SAFS is also an entirely volunteer organization. We have no staff. We, uh, we buy about $100 worth of secretarial and technical services a month. But uh, other than that, uh, we have no staff. That means that we're not able to conduct inquiries. Uh, we're not able to, uh, to go to law. Uh, the Canadian Uni uh, Association of University Teachers, on the other hand, uh, does have the, uh, uh, the money and the, uh, and the mandate to, uh, to engage in, in, uh, in, in those activities. Um, we don't have any paid writers for our newsletter, um, unlike, say, Inside Higher Education or the Chronicle of Higher Education in the States. So we depend on our members for um, uh, knowledge of what's going on at universities. We depend on our members for submissions to the, uh, to the newsletter. And I want to encourage members who have ideas for sessions on themes that matter to SAFs uh, to get in contact uh, with me. Um, we can help with organization. We can help with publi uh, publicization, uh, publicity. Uh, we can help uh, with, uh, with funding. So if a panel discussion or a talk or a movie or something that uh, um, touches on SAF's themes is something that uh, you'd like to do at your university or at a, a public library in your area, please, uh, please get in touch and we can, uh, uh, we can see about, uh, about that. Our members are very important to us and I encourage all of you to uh, consider writing for the newsletter. Um, reports, what's going on, um, uh, opinion pieces, analysis, uh, even uh, philosophy of uh, um, academic freedom and academic excellence uh, is, is, are welcome. Now, I want, to, uh, I, I want to pause for a minute to note that uh, one of our members, a longtime member, Judy Wubnick, died uh, last year. Oh, uh, yes, about 10 months ago, I think, and I, uh, I found out only recently. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, sad to report that uh, Judy Wubnick uh, died. I also want to report that uh, we now have about uh, 220 members, so membership uh, in the society has been growing, been growing steadily over the past couple of years, uh, due uh, uh, to uh, no uh, uh, small degree to uh, Francis Whittleson, our outreach and, uh, um, outreach and community support coordinator, outreach and community coordinator, yes, uh, officer, uh, so uh, uh, thanks to Francis uh, for that. Um, I want to uh, talk today about one of, the, um, one of the matters that I think there's some division among SAFS people. Uh, we're all uh, in agreement on the importance of academic freedom and academic excellence, but there are some matters on which, uh, on, on which SAFS, matters, uh, SAFS members uh, divide. And I, um, you know, I'm trying to be a little controversial. I hope I can uh, you know, stir some uh, 
So, so, some discussion and some criticism. Um, so I think one of the most significant differences uh, to have emerged in my discussion with uh, members of the uh, SAFS board and, and members of SAFS concerns freedom of expression on campus. Now, SAFS is dedicated to the free exchange of ideas, the free exchange of ideas by university people on campus, on social media, in the, uh, in the newspapers. Uh, um, in cafeterias, anywhere on campus. So we oppose um, rules and regulations that direct free discussion, uh, free exchange of um, ideas to specific locations or uh, keep them away from uh, certain areas on campus. Uh, so we uh, think there are few, if any, limits to what can be discussed by university people on university campuses in the media. Uh, and few, if any, limits regarding what can be said about all these things that can be discussed. So we oppose rules as to how discussions must proceed and the rest. Um, on the other hand, freedom of expression is not identical to the free exchange of ideas. That is, not all expressions are expressions of ideas. Uh, some expressions are artistic expressions, and some expressions are ventings. Uh, some expressions are... Uh, um, uh, just saying things, getting them off your chest, whatever. Uh, invective is an expression and hardly an exchange of ideas. And not every expressive act is a move in an exchange of ideas. Now there are some who argue that protecting freedom of expression, freedom of expression understood widely, uh, puts that threat puts at risk the free exchange of ideas, and it threatens academic excellence. They would argue, they would say, as a conclusion, that administrators at universities need a fair degree of oversight and control of campus goings-on in order to promote a well-ordered and civil environment for academic business. So the free exchange of ideas, yes, but wide open freedom of expression, no, because it puts at risk academic excellence. What are some examples? What do I have in mind? It's the queers they should be hanging, not the flag. That was a Facebook post by a uh, Ontario College professor um, when he posted a, an article, a story about um, the um, uh, pride flag being um, uh, raised in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. A couple of professors have been chastised for swearing, swearing at students, swearing in class, risque talk and risque repartee. Um, one Ontario professor uh, uh, was uh, uh, chastised by his university for swearing, and there's a case in the States where the uh, professor was eventually dismissed. In Quebec, there's a CGEP professor who declared in an interview that homosexuals disgust me. Not homosexuality disgusts me, homosexuals disgust me. Free speech walls, I'm sure you're familiar with that idea. Um, they attract um, racist comments, invective, and the like. The Queen's Band songbook you might remember from four or five, maybe it's ten years ago, uh, time moves so quickly. Uh, many argued that this songbook promoted, or at least was a symptom of rape culture. In Lethbridge, a professor allegedly posted, it's not clear that he actually posted them, but allegedly posted allegedly anti-Semitic Facebook comments. Recently, your white fragility can go kiss my ass, um, said in a, I don't know, Twitter or Facebook exchange. The rape chant at uh, St. Mary's University some years ago, the dentistry school scandal, and uh, very recently, a Cal State professor who spoke about Barbara Bush after she died. Now, I think arguably some of those cases, and I don't want to say all of them, uh, I think arguably some of those cases fall outside the domain of the free exchange of ideas. Now, if we protect freedom of expression, all of them are protected as free expression. Uh, some argue that because at least in some cases, they fall outside the uh, domain of the free expression of ideas. It's not a violation or it doesn't put at uh, risk the free expression of ideas for university administrators 
to do something about them. Whether university administrators should do something about them is another question, but the idea is that university administrators should be empowered to address uh, these, uh, 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 this sort of expression. I think the Queen's Band example, uh, the Queen's Band songbook example, might be the clearest case of um, um, expression that uh, uh, for people who present these arguments, uh, the, um, uh, the sanctioning of that expression does not put at risk uh, the free exchange of ideas. Uh, maybe the foul-mouthed professor is another case, I'm not sure. So what I want to ask is, well, should universities have the power to sanction people in these cases? Should they regularly use that power? Maybe they should use it only sparingly, uh, but perhaps it's a good idea that they have it, and uh, perhaps it's a good idea that they use it in some cases. Why? Well, because campus atmosphere suffers when people are uncivil or disrespectful. When they're obnoxious, rude, insulting, or intemperate, then the possibility of dispassionate engagement with ideas might be difficult. The bad atmosphere created by invective and insults and um, uh, perhaps um, unredeemably sexist uh, rape-promoting material um, prevents uh, academic life and makes it uh, uh, less enjoyable, at least, our, our research, our teaching, and the like. Okay, so that's the argument in favor of empowering administrators uh, to uh, respond with sanctions and punishments when uh, these sorts of things happen on campus. I want to argue that uh, university administrators shouldn't be empowered to uh, respond with sanctions uh, to, these, uh, to these incidents. And I know that there are some SAFS members who think, who think they shouldn't, so I, I hope we get to, I hope I'm told where I've gone wrong. Uh, nonetheless, I want to say no, safe and respectful campus policies, ones that have punitive force, are a good idea. It's not a sound and it's not an effective way to create or maintain a campus hospitable to the free exchange of ideas. Now, on the other hand, I do want civility and respect. Uh, they matter uh, very much to me. Uh, they're important things. I do accept the uh, premises on which the argument for empowering university administrators to take action uh, is based. I, uh, I accept the premises. I don't, I don't think the, uh, the conclusion follows. I don't think we should be demanding civility. But before I go on, I want to put in a word for incivility. Um, I, think <laughs> I think there are some things to say in favor of it. Um, one thing to say in favor of it is wit. Uh, certainly, we don't want uh, to uh, uh, we don't want people to uh, refrain from uh, witty and cutting remarks, because um, they can be fun too. At the same time, um, you know, uh, uh, not not too much. But I think there is a place for uh, um, you know, a degree of incivility, if it's uh, balanced by, uh, um, uh, by uh, uh, wit and, uh, and, and humor. Uh, but by and large, yes, uh, we do want a civil uh, campus, a campus on which uh, people um, uh, uh, interact with each other respectfully. Now, what's the first criticism of the argument that uh, campus administrators should have the power to intervene uh, when um, uh, expression uh, uh, threatens uh, civility and respect on campus. The first argument is that the university administrators just won't get it right. That policies will inevitably use, be used to, ex to restrict the exchange of ideas. And this will issue in self-censorship and people shying away from controversy. So the first idea is that no matter how bad the effects are of occasional bouts of incivility on campus, uh, by attempting to uh, control for this with uh, rules and regulations, we're going to put at risk stuff that matters to us. Uh, so it's a, it's a better idea to tolerate rather than to respond in a way that uh, uh, might shut down the free exchange of ideas. Uh, connected to this is the possibility of selected application. Uh, you may know that uh, in the Masuma Khan case, the uh, white fragility can kiss my ass case, an argument was made that had someone said something similar, 
uh, who wasn't from uh, the ethnic or religious group that uh, Masuma Khan uh, belongs to, then that would have been appropriate for the university to proceed. But it wasn't appropriate for the university to proceed because this is a person in a marginalized position. So I think the, um, uh, the risk, uh, uh, the chance of selective application of these uh, rules is uh, 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 pretty large and uh, uh, that would be unfortunate. That's, those are the criticisms about uh, the effectiveness of these policies. I want to say that I don't think they would be effective or to the extent that they're effective, they would also be misused and also uh, bring uh, 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 self-censorship and, and shine away from, uh, from controversy. The second criticism is a more in principle criticism. It's about the soundness of the ideas. I think that enforcing, enforcing civility and respect can't be done civilly or respectfully. Um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a contradiction there. Be civil or else is not a, itself a civil directive. Uh, and this hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of um, policies that uh, mandate and force civility will engender cynicism and distrust. Uh, also potentially encourage a, um, uh, a letter of the law rather than spirit of the law attitude in people with regard to, uh, to violations. Now a university is um, essentially, and of course a university has more than one essence, but one of the essence of a university is a, a, a place where understandings are generated. I don't like to say knowledge because I'm you know, a bit worried about uh, the uh, uh, connotations of the word knowledge. Knowledge is a pretty, uh, uh, pretty strict thing. But understandings, we, uh, we generate interpretations, we generate understandings, we want our understandings of the things to be true. That's right. But as well, we want that our understandings are held by us for the right reasons. What are the right reasons? Reasons of argument, reasons of evidence, reasons of example. Policies that mandate civility and respect and the like are instruments that uh, uh, work by the pressures of fear, uh, fear of uh, disapprobation and uh, desire for acceptance. And to believe something or to hold some value because you fear what would happen if you were not to believe it or not to hold it is not uh, a university way. Uh, we hold our values, we hold our beliefs on the basis of what we take to be evidence, reasons, and example. So demands to be civil are pressures other than evidence and argument and are thus inconsistent with the university value of allowing people to make up their own minds for their own good reasons. Well, can nothing be done then? What can be done about the possibility of incivility or disrespect on campus if we're not going to empower administrators uh, to apply uh, rules and sanctions? Well, first I have to accept that uh, a level of tolerance of incivility is expressive of our commitment to civility. Um, as civil people, we're not going to try to shut people up. Unless, of course, you know, as Michael Oakeshott said, if things go to hell, then um, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the standard rules uh, uh, are, are, are off. But I don't, think, I don't think things are that bad yet. But second, yeah. <laughs> second uh, example, our own dispassionate pursuit of understanding and our own civil relations with others respond to incivility with civility, respond to disrespect with respect is a good way of encouraging a civil and respective campus. Third, the critical discussion of manners, comportment, interpersonal exchange. Talk about university and university life and university values uh, and that can uh, bring people over to civility. So thank you, I'll take uh, questions and comments and um, Criticisms. Oh, Phil. Yes. I was um, <coughs> an engineer, I was an engineering mentality to this, which is to try and find difficult compromises. Uh, to that point, <coughs> I was at a lecture by a, an Oscar Hall horse prop on arguments about how to interpret the Canadian uh, human rights, uh, or in fact the, the Bill of Rights. 
and he goes on to about, he had a whole series of discussions about various people trying to apply the Bill of Rights to various issues. And after the, the lecture, I went to him and I said, I don't think there are any such thing as human rights existing in a, in a more platonic sense, say, the mathematical mm -hmm. ideas. And his reaction was, you just graduated from Oscar Hill Law School. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, my point is that I don't think mathematics exists in a platonic realm either, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, let's have a fight about that. Um, the, the, the point is that I think that there aren't any absolute rights in that sense. There are just awkward compromises between various difficult situations. And my point would be is unless we do have a reasonable degree of stability, the system will impose something on us. And that's the problem. And how do you avoid that kind of difficulty? Right. And Eva, you want to speak to this? Yes, I, I think at some level, there's a fundamental confusion in this dichotomy that you've, you've uh, uh, described here. Uh, I think you're talking about misbehavior rather than the expression of ideas in a vulgar way. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know, people screaming down somebody else who can't who can't get a word in. That was one of the examples. Admit, that, 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 that there are some policies about that. I mean, no, you you can't run any anything. Mm. Uh, you, you can't run a cafeteria, you can't run in a school if there aren't some rules of behavior that people are going to uh, follow. And we've got to the point, uh, generally in our societies, where uh, certainly I'm old enough to remember a time when I don't think in my childhood, I'm not sure whether one even heard the F word at all very much, but now, you know, people can't utter one sentence without using it three times. Well, it's a well something's gone off the rails here. And uh, it, I don't think our professors should be uh, giving their lectures or whatever it is they're doing uh, using that kind of language. Mm -hmm. There should be a code of behavior, and I'm talking here about behavior. I think all ideas must be up for discussion. All ideas, no matter how contradictory, but we must argue them in a civil fashion. There must, however, be rules of behavior, which is uh, confusing misbehavior with just another expression mm -hmm. is, I think, one of these uh, nonsense of our times, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just, you know, I, I know it's more complicated than that, but I really do think that perhaps the, the level of misbehavior, both among mm -hmm. students, faculty, and administrators, has got to a, an intolerable point. None of my examples were of disruptive behavior. None of my ex and 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 I'm I, I I'm not including that among. Uh, That's not what I what I gathered from what you said. One other small point: we talked about wit versus incivility, and that's precise. That is that is. Uh, <coughs> if you're witty, you don't have to be incivil. In the incivility, uh, you can be you can be very cutting mm -hmm. and witty, but you don't have. I mean, this White House correspondence dinner this week in Washington was a good example of this total vulgarity and just gratuitous insults, moronic, childish insults. <laughs> Nothing witty about it at all. I laughed and start to think. <laughs> <laughs> we have different sense of humor. <laughs> but no, in, in, in response to these two comments, uh, first, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about disruptive behavior. Yes, okay. I think uh, the uh, uh, so uh, there, people... there are boundaries, though. But you've admitted that there must be boundaries. Uh, people who try to... Uh, shut down things, uh, shout down speakers and the like. I think that's, that's, that, that, that's a, a, a different thing and that should be, uh, 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 sh shouldn't be tolerated. Um, why not? Because uh, people who would engage in this are not at all taking part in the, the life of the university. Um, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that everything that we shouldn't do should be something we're not allowed to do. Right? And I think that the, uh, the examples I gave are cases of that. Uh, I'm not uh, endorsing um, any of these behaviors, so I'm happy to call them uh, misbehavior. Uh, and I do think they uh, tell against what we're trying to do as dispassionate inquirers, as, uh, uh, as university people. Um, but my 
my, my first claim is, is, is that the administrators aren't going to do it well. That uh, sometimes, um, I think even in some of the examples, are arguably moves in the free exchange of ideas. And I don't want that ever to be compromised, even if it means tolerating uh, some degree of incivility. Yeah, but um, but you, you say some degree. Mm -hmm. You've already conceded the point that at some point you've got to intervene. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, so, so this is the question. Sure. How and when do we know when that point has been reached and what do we do about it? Well, that's the, that's the point. Yeah, it, uh, that's, the, that's, that's certainly a matter of judgment. I don't think that um, we can lay down rules or criteria ahead of time to know uh, when we're there. Uh, I don't think we're there, we're there now. But yeah, there are um, other, Bruce uh, and, and, and Francis. Uh, I, I tend to agree with the case you've made. Um, I think there is a way to distinguish between the disruption kind of problem mm -hmm. and the speech problem. And that is to say that the case you're making is that the content of speech should not be a thing that administrators look at. Yes. But time and place of disruption mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and, and if you look at speech as a transaction, a mm -hmm. transaction between speaker and listener, say in a classroom, you have a student who won't shut up, <coughs> won't allow the teacher to teach. Well, that's not about the content. Mm -hmm. That's about the fact that he won't shut up and take place in yeah. the environment in which he takes place. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the the idea that we should not allow that kind of disruption does not affect at all the case you're making, which is content. Is not a matter for an administrator to interfere with. And some of the examples that you mentioned, <laughs> although they do not appear to be very well argued ideas, they're still ideas. Well, you know, I, I tend to agree with that, but I, I, I wanted, for the sake of the argument on the other side, uh, to suppose that there's nothing of academic merit here. But, but I, you know, and I'm fine. That's the right sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It says, you know, Barbara Bush raised a war criminal. Mm -hmm. That's not very well argued, but it is an idea. Mm -hmm. And it's dangerous for us to come along and say, well, that's a bad idea, and therefore it shouldn't be allowed. I, I think that leads down the path to a very bad <coughs> idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Francis? Yes, thanks. Thanks for that. I really think your talk is great. Um, you've actually changed my mind on this subject a lot, because I, I used to be more in favor of, of rules. One of the interesting areas that you didn't mention is libel and slander, mm -hmm. um, which I think, and just to give people an example, uh, there is an uh, English professor and general education professor at Mount Royal who just a few days ago uh, wrote uh, some comments on Twitter about me being a pathetic racist. And, uh, and then when I just kind of sent an email to him, uh, CC'd to a whole bunch of other people saying that I didn't want to censor him, he could go ahead and call me a pathetic racist uh, as much as he wanted, but I thought this was unethical and so on. I gave my reasons for it. He came back and, and actually responded to everyone else as well with all the reasons why he thought I was a pathetic racist and then called Lindsay Shepard a, a white supremacist sympathizer to boot. Um, and so I, I really, and a couple of years ago, I would have even considered perhaps legal action against him uh, for what he was doing, but I don't think that's the right approach. What I want to do is publicize what he has done as much as possible to allow people to discuss what it means to be a racist or a white supremacist sympathizer, let different people view that, and let people come to their own judgments about whether he is in fact right in terms of what he's arguing. If I wanted to be coercive with him, which I could have been, it would not have created a good dynamic at all uh, in the university, and it's possible it would have gone into some uh, confidential complaints process where none of these ideas could, could be discussed because it would have come into this kind of legal type of framework instead of what exactly is the argument that is being made here, and is it right or is it wrong? Which I think is a very important thing to happen at a university. And I'm just wondering what your views are on libel and slander, and is there really a, a kind of a line with respect to that? Well, uh, 
I don't have firm views on, on libel. I, I do think that um, you know, Canada's libel and slander laws are unfortunate, that they're, they're, they're too broad, and that you know, we're moving towards the, the, the British model, and that's unfortunate. Can I ask you what you would do in this circumstance? Yes. I read about this. If the next stage was someone says you should be dismissed because you're a racist, blah, blah, whatever. Well, I would then, say. Then what would happen? Well, I think if it's public, that sort of thing is much less likely to gain traction. If we have, if we fight in the university for an open environment, um, it makes it much less likely that that tactic can be used. It is a difficult thing, though, because people can say things, call someone a child molester, like those kinds of things, which can have huge consequences for people. But if it's, if it's really open, there can be pushback against that, uh, that those kinds of accusations, which I think is is the what should be pushed for more than you've said something that is you know going to damage my reputation. First of all, I don't think what this uh, professor is saying is going to damage my reputation because no one's going to no one's got any sense is going to be listening to him anyway. But it's possible that there could be someone who does say something. Mm. Um, it is, and I, I really do struggle with the libel and slander because I can see that it can have very damaging consequences. But again, I don't see how that can be, you know, Conrad Black uses, you know, he uses as a tactic to stop people from criticizing him. Like he says he's going to sue the people and I think that's, that's again another problem to be doing that. So there's... Timothy? Oh yeah, I have. Sorry, and I'll look over to this side of the room next. Well, so. <laughs> on behalf of the ministers everywhere, okay? um, if, you're, if you're not teaching, the ministers have to be able to frame the speech in the class to some degree. So if I hire you to teach uh, <clears throat> math, and instead I find out that you're teaching English, right? as a university administrator, I need to be able to come in and constrain you to what it is. <coughs> so I think. Just, there must be some constraints, and those are tied to the syllabus or the, the policies of, of the organization that frame what should be in yeah. the syllabus. So there is some control well, over what, what can be said. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Timothy, I, I agree with you. On the other hand, I, I, I'm, I'm doubtful that um, instructing professors this way or that way is making them better teachers, could make them better teachers. Uh, and <laughs> uh, your, your example, um, math teacher teaching English. Exactly. Yeah, but I know what you're getting at. I know that there are cases that are, um, that, that, that are borderline. Um, <coughs> critical discussion, I think, is the, the first step. Uh, the problem is that if the, uh, the administrator has a, a, a rule in back, then there is no critical discussion because that's always on the fellow's shoulder. Um, I, th I think the, the, you know, the possibility for self-regulation at a university or self-control at a university is, uh, is, is really quite great. And I don't want anything that um, would, uh, would, would, would lessen that. And I think that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the bad teacher isn't going to become a better teacher by being forced not to do this or, or, or do that. Well, if you look at so the, the, the community colleges in terms of how their academic freedom has now been put into their collective agreement, is it's very clear they have very broad uh, academic freedom rights, but those are explicitly constrained in the collective agreement mm -hmm. to university policies, right, of one yeah. type or another, and that would include what should or should not be in your um, yeah. uh, curriculum. Because it's in the collective agreement, mm -hmm. that means that if I, as an administrator, I'm an administrator, uh, <laughs> try to uh, stop you from teaching something and I'm doing it improperly, you have an avenue yeah. for stopping me, right? The grievance process. Mm -hmm. So I still think that there are natural and there are effective constraints, and that through the oh my God, but through the grievance process that you can ensure there is due process mm -hmm. if I go beyond what I'm supposed to go beyond. Mm -hmm. The challenge will be how many of you are actually deeply involved in your associations mm -hmm. in order to ensure that they're properly representing you. On this side, oh, uh, uh, Bill, sorry. Your, your early distinction between expression and ideas I, I find uh, not convincing. Uh, <laughs> uh, expression and ideas? 
No, see, there, there are things that can be expressed that aren't ideas. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that's true, and I'm very sure that I don't want to empower an administrator to uh, make the distinction. Good. I think you, 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 you've, you've, put us, you've put us, you know, very firmly in front of the reality that there is no free lunch. Um, you know, we're going to have to tolerate uh, the civil expression of, you know, distasteful or tasteless ideas or, or hateful ideas, etc. So if I very civilly uh, and articulately say that we should hang all of the X's, um, uh, okay. my idea is, is, is hateful. But, you know, I think there's probably a, a, a broad group of us who say that, you know, uh, the idea of public expression uh, can be met with uh, uh, counterweight public expression uh, to the overall salutary benefits. So mm -hmm. if the Queen's band is uh, making uh, sexually coercive uh, uh, verse, uh, there should be a groundswell of people who articulately respond to that, and the net benefit, you know, may be, actually it's a good thing they, had, they, they made that song because we could surface these issues and, you know, uh, in, in an articulate way. That was my argument. That yeah, was my I, first I argument. <laughs> but, but what, what I, I, I want to get back to the, what I believe the, the dangerous idea of, uh, you know, uh, distinguishing between things that are ideas and things that are not ideas. I mean, yeah. it's pretty tough for me to imagine what's not conceivable as an idea or to empower someone to... And the, other, the other comment is, you know, in this room there may be some sympathy for the understanding, at least my understanding, that civility, very, very important. It's very, very small beer on the campus these days. We're in an unspeakably censorious environment, uh, which is the antithesis of the disputative uh, context that you want. So this is, this is a very well-placed discussion, but in perspective, uh, I'm much less worried about civility uh, that I am worried about uh, the hammer of censoriousness. Mm -hmm. I think we're out of time. We want to. Oh well, Selim, yeah, let's that last uh, last question comment. I uh, uh, I'll go back a um, couple of minutes about rules. We're talking about rules, rules to ensure civility uh, or anything, any rule. At what at what point? My question is: At what what at what point do you stop making rules? You can make rules. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, yes, yeah, no, no, uh, that, that's right. There's the um, anthropologist Graeber, I think, is his, uh, his last statement, talks about the utopia of rules and how a rule mentality is very easy to instill in a community of humans, and, and once it's there, um, it just blossoms, yeah. But you will always find people who love making rules. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll take a break for about 10 minutes and come back with uh, the next session.